Hello, everybody. Hopefully, everybody's been doing well. I'm getting over for the next three months, actually. Um, I will be trying to get over an infection around my heart and my lungs. So wish me luck on that. I apologize if I'm hacking up a lung throughout this video. Now, my professor, as a part of my PhD program in cognitive science, wants me to do a video for extra credit on the psychological mechanisms that had changed American perception towards 9-11. To put this in different words, how did 9-11 shape American psychology? And how was that manipulated by the American government? Okay, well, this will be a fun thing. <laughs> so I apologize in advance. I'm not gonna use any editing equipment or anything like that due to uh, the fact that it's in finals week. So wish me luck on that. So anyway, most people, at least in the US, know that 93% of Americans, or roughly, well, most Americans, know exactly where they were at in the time that 9-11 had happened, or during the time. I don't know why I'm using such weird words. During the time 9-11 happened, most of us know what we were doing or where we were. For example, I was in first grade, I was on the playground, I was told to go home and all the adults were freaking out. That's all I know. Now the question is why? Why is this a situation? Well, first, we have to understand the psychological mechanisms that had changed our psychology before we understand how it was manipulated. So first, ugh, sorry, I'm getting comfortable here. First, let's look at PTSD. Most of us have heard about it. Most of us have a general idea about what it entails. PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. It is essentially a mental or an emotional stress that is caused from an injury or some type of a shocking event. Now, one of the big things that I always wondered was why are people who are living outside of New York City experiencing PTSD? No, that's a serious question. Why? Why would they? They weren't the ones that were attacked. Well, it's interesting because there's something called relative risk appraisal. Essentially, to put that in normal people terms, even though there was an attack in a different location, people living far away with no effect from that location also experienced the same PTSD. And the reason for that has to do with the media. As a matter of fact, there is something called a linear correlation, or with the increase in the watch time of media comes the increase in anxiety and PTSD related to September 11 attacks, which is why every September 11th, when they have a marathon of watching footage of people jumping from skyscrapers, how the people who watch that video generally are the ones who are the most scared. Now, what that does is it creates something called probability neglect, where we overestimate or sometimes underestimate a situation to occur as a result of the fact that it is seared into our brains. And obviously, I'm heinously under, or oversimplifying this, and my professor is probably going to get mad about that, but hey, I got to make it palatable for the average person. So essentially, even though 9-11 has only happened once in the history of the U.S., we are scared that it will happen again. The reason why we are scared is because if it happens again, even though the odds are very slim, the danger is so severe that we cannot risk that happening. Now, there are two reasons why this is scary. Something called dread risk and unknown risk. Dread risk is the concern of catastrophic and uncontrollable aspects of hazards. Now, the Bush administration in particular was very aware of this, not surprising considering the fact that they had an academic Condoleezza Rice in the office with them. They're very aware of this. As a matter of fact, one of the things that scores highest on dread risk is nuclear weapons and nerve agents. Those were the excuses that the Bush administration used to manipulate the American public. Who would have thought? The other one is unknown risk, and these things are not observable. So the things that you feel like are around you, but you don't know when it's going to go wrong, how it's going to go wrong, and what's going to happen. And a good example of this would be like the 1980s, the fear regarding microwaves and water fluoridation, these sorts of things. Well, what dictates whether or not we are scared of one or the other or how scared we are of both has to do with something called signaling potential. How obvious is the risk? What are the signals and the signs and symptoms that show that something might go wrong? So for example, 9-11 and planes. Planes has a signal potential that's very high. 
planes represent something that crashed into a building. And as a result, we are all terrified of planes. And what's interesting is what we had found out was that following 9-11 for the, f the full next decade, the type of air travel that Americans experienced had dropped by 6.5%, even though planes are still 850 times more safe, I think that's the way you say it, more safe, safer than cars. But because it has such high signaling potential, we're still scared of it nonetheless, even though there's only been one 9-11. And so what we see is that there's extreme demand for more security, and we're willing to take extreme compromises for that security. And then that's when the U.S. said, okay, well, hold on, let's utilize the situation and let's threaten the Taliban government at the time, which ironic because obviously it's the government now as well. But this is when we asked the Taliban government, hey, you need to give us Osama bin Laden or else we're going to invade. And we sure enough invaded, followed by the Patriot Act and everything else in between. Another psychological phenomenon that we had seen is something called in-group versus out-group. And I get it. Some of you are probably going to like roll your eyes because uh, politically we all know partisanship and we kind of know how this goes. But for the sake of getting a good grade on this exam, just bear with me for 30 seconds here. So we have on the out-group side during this particular period of time, we have Islam and then we have individuals several years later in the axis of evil. But with Islam... On March 2002, 25% of Americans, which include 23% of Democrats and 32% of Republicans, say that Islam encourages violence. And so we view that as the potential other. And we also know that there was other situations as well around the U.S. where people who were interpreted to be Muslim, even if they weren't, even if they were Sikh, were bludgeoned to death by an angry crowd. And then later on, obviously, in 2003, we have the axis of evil where Bush says, if you're not with us, you're against us. But that wasn't with Afghanistan. It was with Iraq. Nonetheless, it's still a good example of this particular phenomenon. Now, what's interesting is at this period of time, you have NATO and other allies who were sitting back and they realized, oh, my God, we're going to have to do something about this, because if not, the U.S. is going to never side with us again, more than likely. And obviously, there's probably potential security risks that they're also taking being in the West and potential fears that they have about attacks in the West, aside from just 9-11 in the U.S. But from a cognitive psychological perspective, there's something called in-group validation that was happening or reputation management. They got to keep a good rep to make sure that they're still accepted into the group with the U.S., and with reputation management, you have like a hierarchy of orders. You have like first order and second order. First order is your view about another country. So the U.S.'s view on France, for example. And then second order is how you think another group views you. So how does the U.S. think France views us? So we think, well, uh, the U.S. obviously is not the craziest about France. And we think that the French are not very crazy about us as well. Well, I mean, honestly, I think we're probably right in both situations. And so the idea here is that there's an expression of tribalistic in-group loyalty that, is ha that has to be expressed in this situation. It's also something called risk pooling strategy. It's the idea is like, okay, guys, we're going to have to go and invade a country. But we don't actually know how this is going to go down, especially considering the fact that in Afghanistan, a lot of other world powers have tried this and it hasn't exactly worked out. And so you have risk pulling strategy that says, well, all right, I don't know how it's going to go for me. But what I do know is if I convince my neighbors to also go with me and something goes wrong, then we all have to deal with it, not just me. So the, the burden of the situation is dispersed around the rest of us. And what's actually really funny is risk pooling strategy is a very important tool that we've used historically. And it's actually been used through something called the Maasai tribes. And I probably butchered the bejesus out of that name. But essentially, there's these tribes in Africa that had believed, okay, we keep getting all of these agricultural disasters from earthquakes and floods and drought and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to tag team this situation of poverty and hunger, excuse me, hunger, not poverty. And we're going to share our resources between different tribes. And so if a natural disaster hits one tribe, then the others can compensate. And that's how we're all going to survive. 
Well, same thing going on with Afghanistan. And then obviously you have something called informative or normative conformity. You can either have one, the other, or, or some, I guess you might be able to have both, but it's generally one or the other. Normative conformity says, look, I don't believe anything that's being said, but I still need to stay in this group. So I'm going to roll with it, but I don't actually think this. Informational conformity, very important, especially with war. And that's where you have to say, well, why is the U.S. invading Afghanistan? Okay, so they're doing it as a result of the fact that they were attacked. Well, do we, NATO, think that that is the most appropriate way to deal with the situation? Yes or no? Oh, we do think that's the most appropriate way. Okay, so the U.S. is aligned with what we believe to be the most rational policy. Okay, so we're, we intellectually conform to what the U.S.'s rationality is because we think it's ultimately in accordance with a larger rationality. That makes sense. Okay, cool. And so that actually helps win the general public around the world as well. Because it's one thing to say, well, we have to be friends with the U.S. And it's another thing to say, look, we might be attacked next and we have to do something about this. And then obviously comes shared loss, which is similar to risk pulling strategy, where if you lose, it hurts a lot more when you're alone. Okay, so now let's get into the more juicy aspects of the situation, which is how did political candidates manipulate this situation? Because obviously you have a public that is shell-shocked. They don't know what to do. They're freaking out, and they want more security. Well, interestingly enough, there's a hilarious... Hilarious, not in a ha-ha kind of way, but more like a, oh, God, oh, my God, this is horrible kind of way. And it's this, I guess you could say it's almost like a catch-22, where the more scared people get, the more likely they are to vote conservative. However, the more often conservatives are on power, the more people have elevated PTSD, desires for revenge, and an increased desire for militarism and military interventions. And so they have this they have a situation where they say, oh my God, I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go with the group that's more overtly aggressive. However, when that group gets in power, they don't actually make anybody feel better. As a matter of fact, they actually end up making the people feel worse. So then it's like, it can be viewed as a whole waste of time, but yet it still happens right in front of our eyes. Well, from a psychological standpoint, these things are actually very well known. As a matter of fact, not only did we see a big boost in support for the conservative party, but we saw an extra increase in support through Bush. As a matter of fact, pre 9-11, he had a 50% approval rating. Days following 9-11 afterwards, he had an approval rating of approximately 88 to 90 percent. Jesus, like, I don't know, that's crazy. Even now, it's still crazy for me to imagine. Now, later, granted, all the way to, uh, to when he was leaving office, many years down the line, it dropped all the way, his approval rating dropped all the way to 24 percent. So we went from 50 up to 88 to 90 and all the way down to 24 percent. And that's as a result of people being scared. Now, also, there was a lot of studies proving that there's increased support for conservative policies, and that's why they win election outcomes oftentimes. Though my, my question with this information is if people were that supportive of conservatism as a result of fear, then why did Bush lose the popular vote? Right? Does that make any sense? He lost the popular vote, which kind of pokes a little hole in this argument. So I think... With this, it's like take it for with a grain of salt. I think that people do shift towards conservatism in general because it's viewed as like more powerful. But to what extent people support conservatism as a whole, um, that's where it gets uh, very questionable, I suppose you could say. Now, finally, in the years following the 9-11 crisis and the invasion of Afghanistan, the U.S. government decides to invade Iraq using a very similar method of rationality. Oh, we need to do this because of weapons of mass destruction, nerve agent gas, uh, fighting terrorism, so on and so forth. Well, you see, the problem with this is that the Iraq didn't pose the same security risk. Thus, you're not invoking a high level of fear, and there's not a high level of uh, signaling potential as a result. So they lost that battle. And also, there's no informational conformity. 
because the international community says, well, hold on a second. This isn't true, though. The International Atomic, or what is it, the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, have proven that Iraq doesn't have weapons of mass destruction. So uh, what? And so as a result, they lost a lot of support. They still did it. They still invaded Iraq, but they lost all the psychological mechanisms that were that would allow them to be able to manipulate the American public up to this point. And so this isn't even mentioning all the other tactics that the U.S. government does, like the U.S. military supporting um, Hollywood, so they would increase investments to Hollywood and all these other things. What I think is ultimately important to note here, though, is that during times of fear, watch how politicians react. And a lot of the politicians that are trying to invoke more fear are often the conservatives because they know that they get more support when people are scared. Statistically, conservatives as a whole, conservatism is more catered towards people who are generally more scared about life in general. And so next time you're having a rough day, you see a bunch of crazy things on the news. Be very mindful about how you feel and how other people are trying to make you feel. And I suppose that's the point of this presentation.